Right, it's five past, so I will probably start it up. Okay. So everyone here, you probably know who I am. So I'm Bryony. You would have met me a few weeks ago in our informal just web webinar chat that we had. Um, today, you won't be listening to me giving you a bunch of monologues. Uh, you'll be listening to Barrett, who we have, uh, who's mm -hmm. the other lady on the video. Um, she'll be teaching you about kind of garden design um a little bit more than just garden design but that's the, the first thing that she'll be talking about um and if you do have any questions about anything that Brett's going to go through um if you pop them in the chat i will approach them afterwards um we'll just let Brett do her whole presentation and then we'll do all the questions afterwards um and i can give more information after the presentation is done um, we're aiming for 8.15 for this to, to finish, um, but we might be finished a little bit before, we might be finished a little bit afterwards, so if you do have to leave before then that's totally okay. Um, I think that's everything you need to know from me, so I will pass it over to Brett. Okay, I'll share my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, now I've got to figure out how to make, oh there you go. Very, like I said, very new to having someone else present. <laughs> you There's always something that happens, no matter. <laughs> That's just part of Zoom. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, this is a presentation I made that specifically um, for designing a garden. The first steps that in uh, creating a pollinator garden have already been done for you. So we're kind of jumping partway into the process. You've already uh, determined your uh, goal for your garden that's helping pollinators. And you've looked at your uh, the site where you want your garden to be located and determined if it's sunny or shady, um, maybe what kind of soil it is. And uh, you could sketch it out if you were, um, that's an option. That I've created these plans uh, based on the number of plants that you'll have available to you instead of starting with the space and then figuring out the number of plants to fill the space. I'm using uh, large graph paper, the kind you would find in uh, an elementary school on an easel. And, uh, I've arranged little pieces of paper. So I'll show you how I do that. And I just wanna mention that I'm not a professional designer. I've figured out this method to help uh, some schools create gardens. Uh, and this is how I've, I've figured an, an easy way to do it that I think anyone can uh, apply this method in their own uh, yard. So the first, because you already have your, the first steps done and you will have plants provided, we've, we're assuming that you'll have two of each species of plant. You, the first thing you'll need to do is prepare the site. A lot of people already seem to be working with an existing garden, which means you don't really need to do this step, but there are some people who have lawn or, or some other space where the, the lawn isn't really growing, well, you'll need to do a bit of prep work. So the easiest way to prepare a garden is to smother the lawn, but you need to do that in advance. So if you had been uh, doing your prep work in the fall or last summer, I cover the area with cardboard or layers of newspaper or leaf bags and cover with mulch. And then that blocks the light from getting to the uh, lawn and the weeds. So it, it kills them off, smothers them. So then the next year you can work in that space without having to dig, dig up the lawn. But you, anyone who doesn't have a garden already will have to do a bit of prep work um, the hard way by using a shovel. And those have, I dig out chunks of, of sod and whack the back of it, turn it over, whack it uh, with a trowel so I can knock the soil out of it. 
and then I just compost the what's left of the the chunks of sod. And if you feel like you don't have enough soil after you've done that, if you have a bit of a, a depression, then you can add some uh, purchased soil or compost. You don't want to, you don't need to amend the soil very much. It's actually not a good idea to create super rich soil uh, unless it's a shade garden because many native plants will become too tall and floppy if they're in rich soil because that's different from the, the, the native soil that we have. So you don't need to do a whole lot. If it's compacted, if uh, people have been walking on it, you can loosen it with a pitchfork. I just uh, push it in and wiggle it around a bit, maybe every six inches or so, just to make sure that the roots of the plants will be able to spread um, into the soil, it won't be too hard. And you should remove invasives. If you have an existing garden, um, there are some really common plants in gardens, and they're even still sold in, in garden uh, centers and nurseries that you should remove. They'll just cause trouble. And some of them are really challenging to remove, and it'll be, you'll probably forever be pulling them out or pinching them out. So some really common ones are gout weed, lily of the valley, um, periwinkle. There are some shrubs like Japanese barberry, Japanese honeysuckle. And there are some invasive plants that aren't ornamental that no one has planted, but they've spread anyway, any um, way like buckthorn. It's a shrub. There's dog strangling vine, which is also called uh, black swallow wart. It's a, a, a really nuisance vining plant. And these usually produce a lot of seeds and they spread uh, very quickly in natural and wild spaces. So it may not look like it's spreading a whole lot in your yard, but there's the potential for seeds to spread. And with the shrubs, birds will eat the, the berries and, and that's how they spread. So, for a, a sunny garden, uh, this is the first and most in-depth plan that I'll talk about. Most people seem to have a sunny space. These are the plants that are being provided to you. Some of them are duplicates in, so I've arranged them by season when they bloom. And some of them are duplicates because they bloom both in the summer and in the fall. So this gives you an idea of the, the plants that will be included. In the spring, typically the plants uh, are short. They don't have as much time to grow and they often grow in, in woodlands or in forest clearings. Uh, they bloom early before uh, leaves come out. And the hairy beard tongue has a funny name, but it, it will also grow. Um, you'll find it in, in prairies as well. These uh, plants are all very easy to grow. They're really tough and they grow in a lot of different conditions. So you don't have to worry too much about whether you have sandy soil or clay soil. They seem to grow anywhere in part shade and sun, uh, even in, in heavier shade, some of them. And they're really tough and I've had them self seed even in different locations and they've, they've grown well. They might not bloom as much or they might get a little bit taller, but uh, they're easy to grow. You don't have to worry about them uh, needing a lot of TLC. So typically there are two kinds of gardens. There are borders and islands. So borders have a back and a front, maybe along a fence or a uh, in, um, against a wall or a house. So the taller plants, the conventional way of designing a garden is to have the tall plants at the back, the short ones in the front, and then the medium ones in the middle. So that's how I've arranged uh, the first plan. So the legend I labeled each of the symbols. And here I've added the height 
So you can see how I've um, arranged them. So the tall plants are at the back, as you can see the, um, the five foot tall ones, the, the purple is New England Aster and the five is a um, fall sunflower. And then in the, the front or along and along the edges, I've laid out the shorter plants. And then in the middle, they're obviously the, the medium plants. I've also tried to put butterfly house plants near the edges. So the, the gray um, on the left side, the gray shape, that's pearly everlasting and that's a host plant for uh, American lady butterflies. And the um, orange ones near the, the bottom, the, which would be the front, that's a, a butterfly milkweed. So that's a host plant for the monarch butterfly. And like I said, they're all easy to grow. So I've basically given each plant a square foot. So each square represents a square foot. So when you're trying to figure out how large an area to prepare um, digging out, you can use this as a guideline. So each square is a foot. And some of these plants will get bigger than others when they're mature. So they could use a bit more uh, space in planning for the future. So that's why there's some gaps at the back. The fall sunflower and the uh, New England asters get to be quite big. And these will self-seed, not to be a nuisance, but they will actually, it's a great way to get free plants without much work. So you will have more to work with in the future and you can also collect seed and grow more, which I'll talk about as well. And I've included uh, little mini plants at the bottom for the seasons, just so you can see what will be blooming when. It's a good idea to have at least three plants blooming in the spring, three types of um, native plants or pollinator plants in the spring and in the summer and the fall. So that there's always, uh, a, there's a continuous supply of food for pollinators. And ideally you would have three plants. Eight, these plant, this plant has two of each species, but like I said, they will self seed and you can grow more. And it's not like, it's not helpful to pollinators. It's not beneficial if you don't have three. That's, I often see it recommended three to five of each uh, species, but you need quite a large space for that. And it, it costs more and it's, it's, maybe makes it impossible for some people. So just get started. That's why I uh, titled this presentation, Just Do It. I hear a lot of people concerned about not having a green thumb or not knowing where to start. You just have to get started and you can always improve things in the future, but it's important just to get going and then uh, you'll have the momentum. And so here are two examples of island uh, gardens. They're surround, usually surrounded by lawn or driveways, sidewalks, and you're viewing them from all sides or multiple sides. So you want them to be uh, attractive from all sides. Usually you put the tall things in the, in the center and then the short things around the outside and then the medium height ones uh, in between. And these are, this is a conventional uh, way of designing gardens. Now, often you'll see more naturalistic garden designs uh, based on meadows or actual woodland settings. And they might look messy to some people. So I've tried to apply conventional garden design principles so that the gardens will be appealing to your neighbors as well, who maybe don't have, uh, that will have a more conventional aesthetic and it won't look messy or unkempt to them. So this is the, the island garden plan that I came up with. So again, the tall things are in the center, 
the shorter things on the outside and then the medium height ones uh, in, in, in between. And you shouldn't arrange things when you're putting the plants in, the, in your yard all in lines like this. You'll wanna uh, mess them up a little bit because they don't want them to look like soldiers, but just for the sake of planning purposes so you know how big an area to dig out and you know what you, you'll be working with, I've given each plant its own square. But you can see there are gaps, but they will spread, they will self-seed. So for the shade, uh, there's the same idea of having a, uh, either a border or an island. And these are the plants that you'll have to work with. Some of them are the same. Like I said at the beginning, uh, many of these plants are super reliable and well, they all are, but many of them will grow in various conditions. And I've grown all of these in my yard and, and none of them have died. They've, they've been thriving. And so these are the, the border and island plans that I came up with, with again, with the, uh, the numbers representing the heights of each of these plants. And they will spread just like the uh, plants for the sun. So you will eventually have more to work with. So I've added a few of uh, slides for special cases. I I noticed a few people have Norway maples and I actually just received an email from someone asking about Norway maples. They are difficult to uh, garden under, but it's not impossible. I actually did a, a search on the Ontario Native Plant Gardening Facebook group because I don't have personally have any experience with Norway maples. I have experience with other challenging uh, trees, but not this one. So you will find that it's very dry conditions. Um, the roots are shallow and they might be uh, obstruct your digging a bit and they make it very dry. They absorb a lot of the, the water. But many uh, woodland plants actually grow well in dry conditions. Uh, that's just like a, a natural forest with many uh, trees with the leaves blocking the, the rain from reaching the ground and roots um, sucking up the moisture. Uh, I have a, a spruce tree in the front and I actually use soaker hoses. I, I arrange them in a spiral. And if I need to water, it, it allows me to do it easily. And I've used mulch. You, uh, planting, once you uh, have laid out your garden and you have your plants, you get them in the ground, you should definitely use mulch. Uh, and even in the sunny gardens, it will help uh, prevent moisture loss and it will make it a lot easier to, um, for the plants to establish their root systems. I usually leave a bit of a, a, a ring around the plants so the, the mulch is not actually touching the stems. It might encourage them to rot. So leave a bit of a gap, an inch or two, and then put your mulch around the plant. And when you do have to water, if you hand water, then the water stays right around the plant, it doesn't run off. You'll find that you don't use mulch and you start watering. The, when the soil's dry, the water just runs right off. So this way the water stays right at the plant. And it seems like every year we have a drought. So the mulch will definitely help with moisture loss. Eventually as your plants spread, the plants themselves will become like, um, I've, I've seen the term green mulch or um, live mulch. They shade uh, the ground and help keep the moisture in. But when you're just starting out, you'll need to use mulch. 
And if you use a very fine mulch, I use composted pine mulch, then uh, ground nesting bees can still nest in it. And Norway maples are, uh, the term is allelopathic. They secrete a chemical that inhibits the growth of other plants. And this is uh, not unique to Norway maples. Uh, native black walnuts are allelopathic too. And it's, there are a lot of native plants that grow beneath them. I've seen a lot of lists online. So you shouldn't have a problem. I just should note, I'm not sure if the leaves are what secrete the chemical or if it's the roots and possibly bagging the leaves instead of keeping them on the garden might help, but I'm not really sure on that. And just to, in case you don't know, Norway maples, um, another big problem with them is that they are invasive and because they're not native, they don't really have much uh, wildlife value. They do sequester carbon and provide shade though. So if you have one, uh, it's worth keeping for those reasons. And I've listed a few other native plants that grow in dry shade just because it's an extremely common question. In urban settings, most of us don't have a garden with full sun with buildings and trees all around. I think most of us have gardens where there are areas of, of part shade or shade. And these are plants that I've seen in other lists. And I think all of these I grow in my garden as well. And, and again, they're all tough plants that uh, they're relatively easy to get a hold of as well. And when you're creating a shade garden, it can be helpful to mimic the layers of a garden, uh, sorry, of a forest by including some shrubs. In the future, you could uh, plan for that. Understory shrubs uh, are a layer be between the canopy and the ground layer. And then part shade plants would usually be growing on the woodland edges or clearings. And for woodland plants, I find the best source uh, for a wide variety of shade plants is Connaught Nursery in uh, Sajkali and Cobden, but you will find a smaller selection at other native plant nurseries. They're harder to propagate, that's why they're harder to find. So I just included this plan. I one or two people had pictures of their whole yards. Uh, perhaps there is the plan, long-term plan to make their whole yard into a, a pollinator garden. So I just included this plan from a previous webinar where someone wanted to turn their whole front yard. And so it was north facing. So uh, the circles at, and the brown area um, is a porch and the green circles were cedar hedge at near the house. So there were the shade plants close to the house and then closer to the sidewalk uh, plants for more sun. And then they had a path going through. So it just gives you an idea by repeating plants or maybe you plant part of it at the beginning and then you collect seeds or let them spread. And eventually you can plant the whole yard. And these were, some of the plants, many of the same ones that I included in that plan, in case if you want to do something like that. And the uh, purple coneflower isn't, and the cardinal penstem, and they're not actually native, so I just put an asterisk there to indicate. And this is they are, these are a few shrubs that that grow well in dry shade. The the big circles on the right. So when you plant uh, a garden using native plants uh, that are seedlings, the first year they, most of them will not bloom and they won't even look like they grow a whole lot. That's because they're growing their roots. And so it's a good idea to plant annuals. And it's actually very easy to do. Many of them, you can just plant the seeds outside uh, in the spring. You can start them indoors if you have a sunny window or a grow light. Uh, I do a bit of both, but they will fill in 
the gaps and provide uh, flowers for the pollinators while your native plants are still small. The saying is that native plants sleep, creep, and leap. So the first year they don't look like they're doing a whole lot. The second year they'll bloom and they are getting bigger, but then by the third year they really take off. And these are some examples of uh, annuals that I plant and uh, that I've had success with attracting pollinators. They're all easy to find, well, um, especially if you order from an online, online seed source. I just ordered um, some seeds from William Dam Seeds in Southwestern Ontario and received them after eight weeks. Because of the pandemic, many people have be, been interested in vegetable gardening and most of the seed sources where you buy annual seeds also sell vegetable seeds and there's just swamped with orders and uh, it, it can take quite a while to get your seeds. So there are a couple of native annuals that I plant, but they're harder to find. Jewelweed is uh, common in wild spaces, but it's difficult to find because it really does look quite weedy. And uh, partridge pea is a prairie native that I bought the seeds online, but there are many very common uh, annuals that, that are appealing to pollinators. And, and many of them also provide seeds for uh, birds like um, goldfinches and, and chickadees. And they're, they're fun to grow with children as well because you get uh, quick results. And just to show you what it's like when you plant uh, with seedlings, the top picture, this is from a school butterfly garden. The top picture was from um, mid-June, a couple weeks after the garden was planted. And it's kind of pitiful looking, but uh, you can see in just uh, a few months later how much it had filled in. The orange flowers at the back, uh, it's an annual, the Mexican tithonia, which is very appealing to monarch butterflies. And the, the purple flower on the left is the Brazilian verbena. And the Brazilian verbena actually self-seeded, so we've never had to plant that again. And in the front, the pink flowers, that's their zinnias. And we actually um, got some pictures of painted lady butterflies visiting. Um, they migrate as well as at the same time as monarchs. So it proves that you can um, have results even with the annuals. The, you could plant a pollinator garden with all annuals, but it doesn't have the same benefit for uh, pollinators and other wildlife, especially in the long term. Most native plants, uh, in addition to providing pollen and nectar for pollinators, they also are host plants for uh, moths and butterflies and other, um, other insects, specialized insects. So by using native plants, you can provide food for many other kinds of insects and in, um, especially butterflies and moths with the host plants. So maintenance, once you've got your garden planted and you've uh, put your mulch around it, many of the conventional gardening practices that um, we've used are not beneficial to pollinators. Things like using landscape fabric or chunky bark mulch, uh, obviously things like pesticides, it's, uh, you definitely want to avoid these. Uh, I just mentioned the pesticides, even fungicides and herbicides have uh, detrimental effects. They may not uh, kill pollinators outright, but they have, uh, they call them sublethal effects. So they kill them slowly, basically. And if you just let the insects do the work, you will be able to attract uh, predatory and parasitoid insects. So in addition to helping pollinators, these plants also provide nectar and uh, pollen and 
um, the foliage for these more specialized insects. And they will eat a few pollinators too, but it's not like they're eating so many that it's, it's uh, harmful. It's uh, the natural cycle of things. And these are just the stages of uh, lady beetles. These are actually Asian lady beetles. I have only seen a couple native lady beetles in my garden ever, uh, but it, it's, you can see the, um, how they're eating the aphids. And these are just the different life stages uh, of the insect. They were on uh, butterfly milkweed or swamp milkweed, I can't remember, but it just goes to show you by using native plants, you will be helping many different kinds of insects, not just pollinators. Um, in the fall, usually we bag up all our leaves and put them on the curb and they're taken away. But it's actually detrimental to pollinators because uh, many of them will overwinter in the leaf litter. So the morning cloak butterfly is actually one of uh, a few butterflies that overwinter as an adult uh, with wings. They will go under um, leaves or un under uh, bark, something like that. And they spend the winter there. And the giant swallowtail uh, butterfly, um, black swallowtail butterflies, and many butterflies and moss overwinter as a, a chrysalis. So you can see how cam well camouflaged it is. If you cut all your plants back in the fall and put them out at the curb, then you're actually potentially getting rid of butterflies and other insects along with it. And if you leave your stems standing in the winter, you will be providing seeds for birds as well. Not they're, they don't eat all kinds of native plant seeds, but uh, something like the black-eyed Susans that were in the sunny plan, uh, the false sunflower, the wild bergamot. I've seen uh, goldfinches and um, juncos and chickadees too eating those kinds of seeds. So when do you actually clean up then? Well, in the spring, but you wait till it warms up a bit. And I've seen the, the guideline, you wait until the temperature is con consistently 10 degrees Celsius. That's a bit vague. I don't know if that's nighttime temperature or daytime temperature. And I've also seen there's some question about that recommendation. But basically you wanna wait until the insects are active until they're out of the uh, leaf litter if you were going to remove the leaves from your yard. But I actually just leave the leaves. I rake them out of the lawn, but I leave them in the garden. So I clean up the leaves around the edges, uh, especially in the front yard, so it looks more presentable to the neighbors. But I just put the leaves in the wheelbarrow and I you know, fling them around the garden where it's less visible so that if there are insects there, then they'll still have a home uh, if, it's, if it gets cold. And since you're not cleaning up the garden in a conventional way and you're using plants that some people might consider weeds because they're native and they're growing in the wild, there are um, cues to care. Um, ways you can indicate that your garden is intentional. So that's one reason why I try to adhere, at least in my front yard, to conventional garden design principles, planting in patches, uh, putting the tall plants at the back, and especially in the front yard near the sidewalk, I keep all the plants fairly low, about two, two and a half feet tall, just so nothing's blocking the view and making it look uh, imposing or weedy. I, I use, uh, I made plant tags as well. And I do 
like I said, I try to keep the front near the sidewalk and the edges tidy, very tidy so that it's clear that it's being looked after. And this is just an example of uh, near this, where I planted near the sidewalk. You can see the plants are all really short and I've stuck quite strictly to a color palette as well. So that makes the colors are repeated. And again, it makes it look uh, intentional and like it's being maintained. And this is just a list of uh, pollinator plants that are about two and a half feet or less. So if you do want to use shorter plants uh, in near the, the sidewalk or uh, near a neighbor who doesn't like a wild looking garden, this gives you uh, a starting point. And I just should note that if the soil is very rich or if it's on the shady side, some of these plants might get a bit taller. I did plant the heath asters and they grew to about three and a half feet tall. I wasn't expecting that just because it was in clay soil and it was richer and um, I guess more moist than if it was in a, a meadow, a prairie. And you will have to deal with drought. It seems to happen every year. Uh, some guidelines are planting the right plant in the right place. Don't plant something that needs a lot of moisture where it's dry. If you spot water, I mentioned using the ring of mulch to help keep the water contained and that reduces the amount of water that you need to use. Using soaker hoses, which I'm not using as much anymore. I'm trying to avoid plastic or rubber. Maybe these are rubber, but uh, I also have a tendency to lose track of where they are and then I sever them with the shovel and then they're ruined and I have to throw them away. So I'm trying not to use them. And sometimes I just have to use a sprinkler when you haven't had rain for a month. You just have to do what you have to do. And so I've used the lawn sprinkler. And just if you do that, try to uh, do it um, between dusk to dawn when bees aren't as active. And you will need to do some weeding just because you're following these uh, new gardening, garden maintenance practice doesn't mean you don't have to do anything. It's an awful lot less work than conventional gardening practices. You will have to weed uh, actual weeds or um, plants that you really don't want in your garden, but you also will have seedlings from the native plants. But I like the seedlings because they're free plants. And even if I don't want them, I can give them away. So if you really find that you don't want seedlings or if it's a nuisance, if you do cut off the seed heads before the seeds drop, they won't be there for birds, but uh, it will be less work. Then you won't have the seeds falling to the ground and um, making new plants. You also may wanna collect the seeds to grow plants uh, yourself. And this is just a book that I found at the Ottawa Public Library that has really good information about um, uh, maintaining a native plant gardener. This uh, man is a landscaper in the States. He puts in large scale um, prairie gardens. And because he does it on such a large scale, um, maintenance has to be easy and inexpensive. So he has some good guidelines including planting densely. I mentioned letting plants self-seed so that they shade the ground. That is one method that he uses. And also using a, a hoe to um, remove any weeds. You can do that uh, quickly and, and while you're standing up so it doesn't hurt your back. And these are just some pictures of seed heads 
in my garden. So I collect seeds and I, I grow them so I can give them away mostly as I'm running out of room. And for some seeds that seem to drop uh, unexpectedly or if I don't have time to keep an eye on them, I use organza bags. I just put them around even though they're plastic or uh, polyester, synthetic fabric. Uh, then I collect the seeds and I don't end up losing them. So to grow, if you want to grow more native plants, the easiest way is just to put in, after Christmas is over, I put the seeds into pots outside in the snow. It sounds crazy because it's very different from growing vegetables or annuals, but this is how it works in nature. The seeds fall onto the ground and some of them are eaten by mice and birds and others stay there and, and germinate into new plants. So I just put them in, out in the snow. I buy potting soil and uh, save my pots and I put them out in the snow. You can also, this process is called stratification. Many native plant seeds need this period of winter weather before they will germinate. So you can't, some of them you can start just like you would annuals, but many of them you can't. You have, they need to be out in the snow. Or you can fake winter by putting them in the fridge in sand or vermiculite and just put them in the fridge, not the freezer. It seems counterintuitive because winter is colder than the fridge, but when plants, uh, sorry, when seeds land on the ground and are covered by snow, uh, this area between the soil and the snow is called the subnivian zone, and it's actually uh, quite a bit warmer than uh, the air temperature above the snow. So between that uh, subnivian zone temperature and just the, the spring temperatures and fall temperature being a bit warmer, um, that's what you're trying to mimic in the fridge. And so this is just an example from a few packs of native plant seeds, or if you've collected them yourself, you can have all kinds of native plants. Uh, so this is just swamp milkweed because I know a lot of people are trying to help monarch butterflies. So I, every year I grow lots of milkweed plants to give away, seedlings to give away. And you can just see all the plants that I got just from collecting seeds. So it's very inexpensive, it's very easy. And it also allows you to make mistakes or, or experiment a bit. You can put some swamp milkweed seeds in a shadier spot or in a spot that's maybe a bit drier, despite the name swamp milkweed, they seem to grow anywhere. It allows you to, you don't have to worry as much as if you were buying a $20 plant from a, a specialist nursery and then have to coddle it and, and uh, make sure it stays alive. You can play around a bit because you have more plants to work with. And I've just included some budget friendly gardening tips. Like I said earlier, um, it can be really expensive to garden with growing native plants. It's uh, a lot cheaper, even if you're buying them. But there are other ways you can uh, economize as well. So it makes it um, possible to create a garden and even to create a larger garden. Uh, Sharing plants and, and seeds with your neighbors is a great idea. Uh, leaving your leaves instead of buying mulch, that's what I do. Uh, just trying to see some other ideas. So I, because I grow most of my herbaceous plants, the perennials uh, from seed, then I focus my gardening budget on trees and shrubs because they take a lot longer to grow, then I can grow them. Someone else has looked after them and they're larger than if I tried growing them myself. 
and just starting small. So if you need to reduce, keep the workload small, whether it's digging up the soil or maintaining it, just start small. It's still beneficial and you can always uh, expand your garden later on. Another uh, great thing about native plants and having a pollinator garden is obviously attracting the wildlife. And this has been astonishing for me because I started for many years, I just planted what I, what was the latest plant? What was in the magazines? What was at the grocery store? And it wasn't necessarily beneficial to wildlife. So I didn't see many pollinators. I didn't see many birds. Once I started planting native plants, it's been astonishing what I've seen. I really wasn't, it's embarrassing to say, but I wasn't really that interested in nature before. I didn't frequent uh, parks and trails and I didn't know this stuff was out here. So it's amazing to have a path or a seating area near your garden so you can observe. Uh, it, it's quite phenomenal. Or even planting, locating your garden uh, near a window so that you can see it from indoors when it's 40 degrees in, in the summer or minus 20 and you can see birds going to your uh, plants eating, eating the seeds. It's quite uh, enjoyable and to share with kids to, to spark their interest in, in nature. And this is just an example. I collect some monarch eggs from the milkweed every year and raise them in mesh uh, enclosures. They look like a, a laundry basket, but they're sealed with a zipper with, and the mesh is fine so that predatory insects can't get in. And it's, it's always delightful to share with, with children. And like I said, it sparked my whole family's interest in nature and my uh, older son and I are actually really interested in birding now. And I have the next few slides are just some other sources. If you're trying to identify what you're seeing in your garden, there's some really fantastic books out there by Heather Holm. Uh, these books are at the Ottawa Public Library and Heather Holm has a new book out right now. Um, common, oh, it's, is that backwards on your screen? Common Native Bees. And she has a, a book about wasps too. They're mostly solitary wasps that are not at all dangerous. And you could also um, visit my blog I, where I sh share the kinds of things I've been seeing in my garden. And these are some other sources online and uh, books where you can find information about the native plants and the wildlife that they attract. So that's it. Wonderful, thank you so much for it. Um, in terms of questions, someone did mention um, your photo of the schoolyard. Mm -hmm. um, there's a plant there on the right hand side that has really big leaves and someone was just wondering what plant that is. Uh, I would have to go back. Uh, it looked a bit like a sunflower, but I'm not a plant expert. Well, it so might have been, yes. That site had been a vegetable garden, mm. but with school, uh, no one being there in the summer, the vegetable garden never did very well. The, everything basically died every yes. summer. So they decided to convert that space into a, a pollinator garden. So there were a few sunflowers that grew up randomly just from seeds that had dropped from previous year's sunflowers that, that uh, I think the kindergarten class planted. But they were very top heavy and they had a tendency to fall over. I guess they can't help it when they're really tall and they've got really this head at the top. <laughs> Uh, great, thank you for answering that. Does anyone else have any questions, anything specific about their yard, anything specific about the presentation, um, when you've got a, a self-taught 
expert here on the webinar. Yeah, Kate, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I missed the first part of the lecture because I was busy and I forgot. And uh, will I be able to watch this video later? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Then I'll, okay, thank you. And if while we're waiting for questions or if there are no questions, I can go back and talk about the plants that are included in the plan uh, a little more if people are interested in that. Uh, I, it's always difficult to uh, gauge for me uh, how much I'm going to blab on about things. So I try to, to not talk too much about that at the time, but um, if, if people are interested, I could, I could talk about that. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I feel like everyone would find that interesting, but um, I saw Dale put his hand up first. So we're just going to Dale and see what he says. Uh, yes, I had a question about the annuals and I was just wondering if, like, how do we know how many annual seeds to spread and how big they'll get and will they end up crowding out the little seedlings that we've been given? I'm just not sure. Uh, I've never had any experience with planting annuals from seed. Well, so I, I usually grow the annuals in pots in a windowsill or under lights before I put them in the garden. But if you're just planting the seeds, something like zinnias or cosmos, I often see people just throwing the seeds on the ground. You can thin them if there are too many. So you can just pull some of them out around the native plants so that the native plants will still get sunlight. But I, I didn't really find it a problem. Uh, when they self seed, I do end up pulling some of them when they're not in a place where I want them to be. Uh, the packages usually specify how big they will get and it will take a month or two before they get to their mature size. So your native plants will still get sun. But again, if the package, something like a, a cosmos or a sunflower will obviously be quite tall. So you plant that at the back of a border or the center of an island, just as you would with the native plant. And then if it's something shorter like a marigold or some of the zinnias are quite short, then you would put that near the front. So you wouldn't be shading out everything. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Uh, so if we put down annual seeds just on the ground, because I don't have space for pots, uh, do we hold off putting down mulch? Uh, yeah, you, the seeds would need uh, exposure to the light in order to germinate. So you could just leave where you're planning to put the uh, annual seeds, just leave it bare. So I often don't have enough mulch or leaves to cover everything. So when I said I put a ring, it is actually just a circle of mulch around the native plant. So there are gaps between, but if you have enough mulch, you can eventually spread it over the whole garden to conserve moisture. But if you just put a ring around the plant, then you will still have bare areas for ground nesting bees and for uh, the annuals, growing annuals. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dale. Uh, we'll go to Kate next who had her hand up. Thank you. Um, did you give ratings for different plants on a scale of difficulty of like growing them and easiest rates of success for growing them? Is this for the annuals or the, the native plants? Probably native plants. And I've found that the native plants are very easy to grow. 
I find there are very few of them that I've had difficulty with. And I found that either with self seeding or me just planting them where I want, not necessarily where they should go, they still grow just fine. So Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, when I started gardening years ago, my main goal was just to keep things alive. But I learned that it's really not, that's not really the challenge. It's uh, picking the right plants is the challenge. The ones that you like or the ones that have the benefit uh, meet the whatever goals you want, like for um, for, for pollinators. Mm-hmm. I, f- I find they're very, so there are some that I find I have a lot of trouble with. They're either short-lived or they're just picky, something like cardinal flowers, which are, I try in vain to grow for hummingbirds. They have uh, tubular red flowers for hummingbirds. They need moist conditions. And I have a lot of trouble growing those. Uh, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head, but I find that they're, they're really tough. I mean, they're growing out in the wild with no one t- looking after them, right? So right off the bat, you, you, it's in your favor that they're going to survive, but you can help them along, obviously by watering them mm-hmm. if we're not getting regular rain or providing mulch to help keep the moisture in. But the school garden that I showed you, as with the, we planted that the year before the pandemic. So during, throughout the pandemic, there were times where no one could even go on the school property. No one was looking after them. No one was weeding. No one was watering. No one was putting new mulch. It did really well. I mean, the plants had been in for a year mm-hmm. by then. So they had, they were established, but it was astonishing that it looked pretty good really even the some of the annuals itself seeded and were growing really well and no one was doing a thing it really proved the point that uh it this is really an easy way to garden i one of the reasons i wanted to put the help the school with their garden was because i had been telling everybody how easy it was and i was kind of worried thinking i was misleading people because i've been a gardener for 20 years i thought well maybe i'm exaggerating so I thought well let's do a bit of an experiment and it turned out to be so successful we didn't amend the soil at all we did mulch the garden and we had a mulch path but Mm -hmm. and there was a regular rain so the garden was planted in June the first week of June and we did have regular rain throughout June but then as every year we had near drought so I don't even think anyone was watering everyone was off on vacation and it did fine it still looked good we had a lot of blooms by the time the kids came back in September the garden and the annuals were filled in and it was really impressive and to think that it, we started with mostly seedlings I had no. included a few divisions as well so there were a few mature plants but it, okay. it is easy. Okay. Um, and will I have to do a lot of protection from rabbits and squirrels and things? Rabbits? I've had, well, for squirrels, they just, um, the digging. Uh-huh. So the easiest way to prevent squirrels and chipmunks for digging is to put rocks around. And the mulch will be a deterrent as well. Uh-huh. So... I find that uh, mostly they want to dig in my, my pots uh, where I have uh, my big pots. That's where I find them the biggest nuisance, but they may dig here and there. Uh, so you, just checking to see if they've uprooted anything is a good idea, but putting rocks around them, uh, like decent sized river rocks, because I have a pond, I have rocks around, it seems to discourage them because then they can't dig. So that's what you're trying to discourage them from doing. And I've also used pieces of um, this metal fencing that I bought at the dollar store. It was uh, just loops with flowers 
and it's just was just wire quite open and I would lay them on the ground so that the squirrels couldn't dig there I was blocking it and that seemed to work well too and rabbits I find they're very particular about what they want to eat once it's summer there's so much for them to eat with grass and dandelions and whatnot I don't have much trouble I find mm -hmm. the, the rabbits that hangs out in my backyard is usually eating the grass uh, but if you do find that it's nibbling something mm -hmm. nibbled it down close to the ground the plant isn't dead it will grow back but you might have to provide some protection again like I said with this these pieces of metal fencing they're like a foot long from mm -hmm. uh, Dollarama I think it or the dollar store I can't remember which or chicken wire will mm -hmm. protect but I find that I have the most trouble with rabbits eating shrubs in the winter. That's the most damage that they do for me. Yeah, that's, that's what I have at this time. <laughs> and so, well, I would put ring. So whatever the rabbits want to eat in the winter, I would protect it with rings of chicken wire so that they can't get to it. I have some that they just, I have certain viburnums and, my New Jersey tea that it, every year it just eats to the ground and blueberries. I have no hope of ever getting any blueberries unless I protect them. And usually I forget, but I've let the rabbit eat some things as long as it leaves other things alone. We can, yeah. we can share. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. Uh, we'll go to Sonia. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Thank you, uh, it's Sonia. Um, I was just wondering, I'm sorry, I missed a bit of the start also. Um, and if you mentioned this already um, about preparing the ground for planting, um, the spot that we want to use has grass on it right now. So we, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't, uh, you know, end up having the grass take over again. Um, and if that's covered in the in the first part, I can just watch it. Uh, it is, it's... but I, I don't mind mentioning. So you just have to do the back breaking work of digging out the sod. Uh, okay. and there's no way around it. It's not that bad. I just dig out chunks, maybe six inches. I just put the shovel, the, the I guess it's a spade. It's pointy. Uh, okay. So I just dig out chunks, maybe six inches whatever comes out with the the spade I guess it is um and then I whack the I turn it over and whack the back of it uh, get out my frustrations and just try to break up the soil and then I try to shake it off or rub it off the sod and then I compost the piece of sod and just leave the soil so the main disadvantage of this method is that you're raising weed seeds by disturbing the soil. So you will end up with weeds. Uh, that's one of the advantages of using the cardboard method. I mentioned that at the beginning, it's smothering, but you okay. have to do that in advance. So you would have had to do that last summer, or last fall. You put cardboard or newspaper, or if anybody buys newspapers anymore, or leaf bags, and then put mulch on top of it and it blocks the sun and from getting to the weeds in the sod. Okay. Uh, so it kills it. Okay. And then you don't have to dig it out. But since you have to dig it out, there's nothing you can do. And you will have weeds. So that book that I mentioned, The No Maintenance Garden by mm -hmm. Roy Diblick, he has a kind of a schedule where you have to weed often at the beginning. So maybe every couple of weeks, but as, because you've brought these weed seeds to the surface, once they're exposed to the moisture and the sun, they're germinating. But if you pull them or use a hoe to, to kill them, just be careful. So he uses a, might be called a Dutch hoe or a scuffle hoe or something. And they have one at Lee Valley Tools. It's shaped like a diamond. And so you, it lays flat on the ground and you just sort of, it's, you're just decapitating the weeds. Right. You can use scissors if you have a small space and it decapitates them all. So you're not stirring up the soil and raising more weed seeds. You're just okay. cutting them off. Um, so the annual 
weeds, um, once you get rid of them, they won't come back. But the perennial weeds like dandelions will keep coming back. So those you have to starve by continually, repeatedly cutting them back. So I, I actually use scissors with the dandelions because the roots are too thick. Some people aren't bothered by dandelions because they do provide some nectar or pollen for bees. It's not really a great source, but if you're looking for an excuse not to weed <laughs> dandelions, then that's a good excuse. <laughs> you put a label on it or something and tell them <laughs> keeping them on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I was wondering too, um, I know you had mentioned about putting kind of like the taller plants uh, near the back. Um, just kind of for aesthetics. Um, so our space is kind of like long and narrow and actually, so it doesn't really have a back. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we should sort of place things in, in, a, in a size like that? Well, I would sort of make an imaginary center point. So your tall plants are in the center. And then okay. even if it's, they're all in, lined up along a fence or whatever, put the taller ones um, beside each other. Okay. And then the medium ones on either side and okay. then the shorter ones so that you're repeating that same idea of an island bed or the border where the tall things are together. Right. Or if you wanted, you could make it like a, a wave like that. I mean, there are no hard and fast rules. I mean, there's a obviously an artistic element, creative mm -hmm. element to gardening. So you could um, intersperse them and make it interesting that way. So those are, I guess, two ideas, putting all the tall ones in one in the center or just making it imaginary like a wave. So you've got tall things and then some medium things and short and then back up to tall and then back down to medium and short. Um, Either way would just that kind of repetition. Okay. It look intentional. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's just the, the reason I talk about this so much is that every year there are newspaper stories about someone who's let their lawn go wild or planted a bunch of native plants and they have problems with the the their neighbors or the bylaws. And you can just save yourself a lot of headache if headaches if you just try to make it garden like what people think is a garden, even if you're using native plants. I mean, they're just plants with flowers, right? There's nothing inherently bad about uh, aesthetically bad about them. They just if you let them grow all over the place and look like a meadow, if a meadow is what you wanted, then that is fine, but it may irritate your neighbors because a meadow looks like an unkempt space um, to some people. I, in my backyard, I have, my garden is like a meadow. That's, so I don't have tall plants in the back and short plants in the front slightly, but mostly they're interspersed and just like you would find in a meadow. And I like that, but it's at the back and it's not gonna bother anybody. Right, okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sonia. And um, it's nearly 8 for 15. So we'll just go to Kate last just for the last question and then we can end the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to start a big a big area, just a little area in, in the center front of our front yard. Um, I was hoping to put some boards down to make the mowing of the remain of the rest of the lawn easier for the person who will be mowing the lawn. Um, and so I guess we would cut the cut out the sod and then put the boards, cut out and remove the sod. And put the boards in to, to 
bound the garden mm -hmm. and we have um, backyard compost. So is that what we would put down, um, you know, as gardening media? Because then it won't have the seeds from the grass. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, then you basically you have your own mulch. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that works well. And that's sort of what I do with the leaves, right? So instead of uh, putting the leaves in a pile so that they compost and eventually then putting them in the garden, I'm just leaving them in the garden. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other, but then you don't have to buy mulch. The only issue with the board is that whoever's mowing will have to use a, I don't know what you call it, a weed eater, weed whacker um, to get the grass. Um, that the is close. Near yeah. the board because the lawnmower, if there's a board sticking up, they won't be able to get the lawnmower right mm -hmm. to the edge. Mm -hmm. I also thought that might be easier for me to know where, where it stopped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise you have to use an edger or something, which um, you have to do repeatedly. So, and that makes it look tidy. And again, the idea that it looks intentional and maintained. So it's clear that that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. And again, with the easy, the, the, the search for simple, mm -hmm. um, uh, simple and quickly good looking things that my neighbors will see. Um, is there a couple, again, it's going to be in the center of the yard. So it doesn't have a center. Is there something, a type of plant that you would recommend that can quickly take hold and, and fill the little area and that I could then in the next, like maybe with a few other little plantings within it, but that will quickly cover the area so that it looks nice. And the annuals, that's the quick, they're really quick um, germinating and uh, fast growing. So I think that will fill the area quickest. Okay, thank you. Or vegetables even, I mean, they're just basically a kind of annual. So, and often they're attractive, I mean. Perfect, thank you for your question, Kate. And thank you, Barrett, for joining and for answering all the questions. And um, we are looking at getting everyone annuals. Um, we're just looking at how many we can get you with the funding that we have in terms of we're going to get the, the native plants first and then with what we have left over we see what annuals we can get you. Um, we are looking at getting you those as well so you hopefully will have something to bloom this year rather than just waiting for the native plants to bloom. Um, I will let everyone go. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for Brett uh, to joining on and thank you everyone else for spending your Tuesday evening joining in. Um, it is being recorded so I was I have I don't I have to cut some of the beginning off because I recorded it with me just waiting. <laughs> so the first 20 minutes is going to be me waiting. Um, so once I figure out how to cut that and um, where to put it, you'll get an email from me with the recording, but you will get a normal follow up email anyway tomorrow. Um, so if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to email us um, and then Barrett also gave her website if you did want to reach out to her or have a look at what information she has on her website too. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.